Welcome back to episode 10 of the step through. We've made it to 10 episodes. I apologize for not having one last week. That is a scheduling gaffe on my part. And as penance, the Los Angeles Sparks have lost five games in a row, but WNBA is still mercifully in full swing, having a great time watching. And I'm joined as always by Evan Gualberto. Evan, how are you doing? Ooh, I mean, it's getting tight. It's getting tight. Getting tight. Uh, I'm doing fine, but you know, things are tensing up. How are you? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, the, the sparks lost on my birthday for the third year running. Uh, so good times. <laughs> uh, consistency is key. Yeah. You know, it is what it is. Uh, when I was 12 years old, they clinched a title on my birthday and have since won once on my birthday since. <laughs> so here we are. That's a, a title is, it means never having to say you're sorry. So. Exactly. <laughs> don't know where that's from one of the great truisms that uh, i think brian windhorse likes to put that out all the time <laughs> anyway um so we're we're like two weeks away from the end of the regular season and you'd think this is the time when teams start to come into form and you know put on their best foot forward for the postseason run and that is the case for some teams and not so much for others but this is the beginning of the show. We like to focus on things that are going well here. So what I wanted to start with today is the Phoenix Mercury, who have not lost a game since the Olympic break. Relatively cupcake schedule since then, but hey, you got to do what you got to do, you know, take care of what is in front of you. And to me, the most impressive thing so far for the Mercury is one Skylar Dean smith And admittedly, she is not the Olympian who tends to get the most press from the Phoenix Mercury roster. Uh, Brittany Griner's been playing excellent. She was excellent in the Olympics. Diana Taurasi has been just doing Diana Taurasi things and projecting utmost confidence despite the situation the Mercury found themselves in heading into the break. But I am just really enjoying watching Scott Dickens Smith, which, you know, for some regular watchers of the show is not something that I've always expressed interest in. Um, Skylar is more of a volume scorer than my type tends to, tends to lean towards, but, uh, She's playing the point guard role very well right now for Phoenix. And that's the kind of thing that's just been delightful to see over the past few games is just her pick and roll combinations with both Griner and Bree Turner. Excellent stuff. Like these wraparound passes that she's making in the post, the, you know, it's, it's fairly easy, I think, to hit a rolling Brittany Griner just because of the, the catch radius that Brittany Griner has, but it's still, it still has to be done, you know? And I think Skylar's just doing a great job of setting her bigs up. And it's showing. I mean, she leads the league in scoring over the last two weeks since we last recorded, and she's third in assists. And again, like we mentioned earlier, Phoenix is just winning again and again, and they've put themselves in a position for maybe a buy in the first round, which is not a position I thought that they would be in, just like as of the last time we recorded. Yeah, I mean, what is there to say about the Mercury that winning winning cures all? Like, you could mm-hmm. have your problems with perhaps their defense or perhaps like what they will be able to do defensively um, going forward. But I mean, when you're winning, nobody really seems to care about the rest. So I pulled some stuff from Synergy. I was also impressed by Skylar. Not the most accurate depiction of what a player can do, but it's what I have access to. So it's what I'm going to use. Um, as a pick and roll ball handler, Skylar actually ranks in the 95th percentile in points per possession. And so if you factor out a minimum number of possessions, she's second to only Arike. Damn. Which is, I mean, that's always good. (laughs) Um, She also ranks fairly highly in in the spot ups points per possession, 91st percentile in the league. It's like, she's no longer, last time we talked about her, I believe I said something along the lines of like, she's overburdened as a playmaker. She is no longer overburdened. Now she can do what she does. And coming off of a gold medal, that that seems to be. It was the confidence boost that she definitely did not need, but now she has. Yeah, what's interesting about Skylar coming off the gold medal, and you and I talked about this a little bit yesterday, um, I think on the Premium Hoops podcast with Mark Schindler, but Skylar didn't get to do a lot in the Olympics. Like She was maybe the fourth guard in the rotation, maybe the fourth guard in the rotation. I think that might even be a little bit charitable to how much she was playing in the Olympics. But... To be in that environment that's so competitive, you know, Team USA, just quite literally the hardest team in the world to make other than maybe like 
geek at, uh, you know, just to be there and like soak up the competitive juices of everybody around you and be in those practices every day. I think that just motivated her so much to prove that she belonged there and that she's capable of doing even more than what she was able to show on Team USA. So like she kind of got the best of both worlds where she got the gold medal, but is also now not tired because she wasn't really working that hard for Team USA, for better or worse. Yeah, yeah it's it's the being around the greatest players in the most competitive atmosphere, like that always is gonna make you better, like whether you're a coach or like you're you know, on the USA select team, as like people call it, like exactly th- that atmosphere, it, like, you know, iron sharpens iron, all of that stuff. But like, I mean, yeah, she didn't play a whole lot. Um, could have something to do with where she went to school. Maybe, maybe not. Just thought I'd throw <laughs> that in there. Hey, Jewel Lloyd got to play. <laughs> that's true. That's true. But Jewel Lloyd, no, never mind. We don't, we don't have to talk about Jewel Lloyd. Oh, actually, Something I would like to touch on since we are recording this on a Friday. Normally we record on Thursdays. Jewel Lloyd, her defense, because I watched the Storm game last night against the Liberty, her defense in the second half, specifically that fourth quarter, um, another thing that impressed me. So just I'll have a couple of highlights playing here, talk a little more so there are a few more highlights, (laughs) but just wanted to touch on that. Yeah, it's funny. I uh, checked the score in the second half because I was focusing more on the Aces game yesterday. And the Storm were down 10 in the third quarter when I went to go pick up my dinner. And, you know, silly me doing the standings watching, thinking, well, the Liberty can't win because that would put the Sparks in a bad position. But good old Storm coming through, you know, <laughs> making it look like 10 points was child's play for them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, but the thing, too, is like we've talked about this a lot. And I believe it was Walt Hopkins that said like, that, you know, it's not really a want or an effort thing. It's just the fact that like Brianna Stewart took over. And when Brianna Stewart starts to take over, there's nothing in the world that you can do. So we're never going to have this opportunity again. So we missed getting to react to Brianna Stewart's White House outfit. So I thought I'd bring it up. Ah, there's no, I've texted you this. Like Stuart B. Anthony is like the outfit. Like I ultimately, like it's what I called it. I just a quick minute and a half on that. What do you have? So Kevin Pelzen wrote a really nice article about the Seattle storm yesterday about how they've fallen into this funk over the last three games. And I think the one thing he missed pointing out on was that Stewie embarrassed herself nationally with that outfit at the White House. And it's just a malaise that has followed for the past week. And maybe they're past it now. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, that's it. That was that's all. factor number four. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then another thing like we never, ever get to do that. Like since we had two weeks off, we have a bunch of step throughs to get to show people. Asia has two, uh, one against the dream and another against the sky. And you pointed this one out to me. NECA, NECA had a fantastic one. The Atlanta Dream was sort of the anti Phoenix Mercury at this point. Um, I like they kind of to me need a top pick more than Indiana does, uh, because like Lord knows the Kennedy situation, uh, Mm -hmm. in Atlanta, you just need something to like, but then again, like Indiana. Like they don't have a Kennedy situation, but they waived Lauren Cox. And does does Kaiser have play? Uh, I I don't think so. Does she? Like, is she on personal leave now? Um, so I mean, I think that's the that's the biggest thing. Is does Indiana need the number one pick? No, they're probably not going to no. play her anyway. Yeah, so. <laughs> right. <laughs> like Ari McDonald plays for Atlanta. Yeah. Um, so get Ari McDonald a fun forward partner, and I will watch the Atlanta Dream. You know, give me a re-signed Courtney Williams. Shan Parker back from maternity leave, always energetic Mo Billings. Like there is Crystal Bat- Bradford Brat- back from foot surgery. Lots of reasons to watch Atlanta. I can't say putting a topic onto Indiana is going to make me want to watch the fever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, there's nothing. Um, God, it was, we didn't even have Indiana on the docket, but I found a way to <laughs> slander their fan base. Good Lord. <laughs> 
That's why we okay. say all the good things about Notre Dame. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what we got to do. <laughs> Just a little push and pull. <laughs> yep. Um, so um, if there's nothing else that you want to talk about, like that impressed you this week, I have a question. Um, this is something like we haven't gone to in a while, but like for new viewers or people unfamiliar, could you please explain the WNBA playoff format? Yeah. So we're about what two and a half weeks from the start of the playoffs and the WNBA has a unique format relative, I think, to most professional leagues, especially in the United States where conferences are not accounted for at all. Um, only the top eight teams, just regardless of East West advanced to the playoffs, which is why we've been talking about this, you know, mythic race for eight over the last week or so. Uh, but yeah, it, theoretically six teams from the West could advance to the playoffs and two from the East. And there's nothing in the rules that would prevent that. Um, I mean, obviously, if you know, my preferences, you know, that's exactly what I'm rooting for six teams from the West and two teams from the East. But yeah. Uh, so the way it works is the first round of the playoffs is single elimination where five plays eight and six plays seven and the higher seed gets to host that game. And then the next round of the playoffs is also single elimination where three hosts the lower seeded winner of the first game and four hosts the higher seeded winner of the first round. Again, single elimination. And then we move on to the semifinals where the one seed hosts a best of five against the lower seeded winner of the second round. And the two seed hosts a best of five against the higher seeded winner of the second round. So to put that all into better perspective, um, if you are a three or four seed, like you're the third best team in the WNBA, there is a chance that your playoffs will come down to one game. And if you lose, that's it. Um, that is what happened to the Los Angeles Sparks last season when Nakagumike had a concussion and could not play in the playoffs and they lost to Connecticut in their second round game. And that was that. Um, it should be a little bit better this year because all of those three and four seeds will have home court advantage in the game as opposed to just being in the bubble. Um, but, you know, the only guarantee you have of playing a full playoff series in the WNBA is if you are a top two seed. And I think not coincidentally, um, you know, that also gives you like a week of rest before the playoffs start for you because they have to fit in those single elimination games before your team gets to play. But I, I do think that there's, Part of the reason that only the top two seeds have ever won a title in this WNBA format for the playoffs, which started in 2016, I want to say. Um, and only one team has ever made the finals after not being a top two seed. And they, as you can imagine from my previous statement, did not win the finals. So um, it's really good to end up in the top two seeds because uh, I think it's great that the WNBA involves so many teams in the playoffs. Uh, but it's kind of shady if you're a three, four seat, because you could just have one bad shooting night and poof, your season goes up in flames, even though you were not just top half of the regular season, you were in the top third of teams during the regular season. I know there's been a lot of uh, conversation that it's fine for the five, six, seven, eight games to be single elimination, but maybe make the, th the second round, like a best of three, at least um, that doesn't, that doesn't involve like some extra travel because for best of three, you kind of have to go like home away home, which is two additional flights. Um, I know back in the day in the early 2000s when the WNBA had best of threes, the higher seed would go on the road first and then they'd come back home for the final two, which is less travel, but you're kind of digging yourself a hole to start the series, um, which I don't know how people feel about that. But to me, it's you never want to start a series on the road if you're the top seed, right? So I understand how they landed on this format. Uh, I still think that to make it as fair as possible, that second round probably should be best of three. But yeah, that's that's what we're working with here. Um, that's how two thirds of the teams make the playoffs because the playoffs could just be one game for them. Um, but I mean, we've had a lot of fun with the single elimination games over the past few years. Like we got that Shea Petty game winner in the bubble last year. We had the Dierk Hanvey game winner in Las Vegas a couple years ago. Uh, Jordan Canada somehow does not miss jump shots in single elimination games. I, I don't know where that comes from, but uh, it's definitely a high quality source of excitement. And it's not like they're the best teams are necessarily suffering because of it, because 
like we said, the, the cream always does seem to rise and those top two seeds are generally making the finals. So I think it's a good balance of like, hey, we're introducing this March Madness type excitement while also getting a high quality WNBA finals most of the time too. Right. And it's that thing of like, I mean, in in most series, I guess you would say that, um, sorry, if in the playoffs, you have a playoff series, for the most part, the the better team comes out on top, like, you know, excluding injuries and things like that, the mm-hmm. better team will win in a series because you can factor out hot shooting nights or whatever. <clears throat> but like the most excitement is early on when it's a winner take all game. It's mm-hmm. it's maximum drama. And then you get to like the back end of the playoffs and it's just like, oh, OK, these these are the juggernauts of the regular season there was a reason for that and now they're just going to bludgeon teams like, yeah <laughs> one and two seeds uh, it's i mean it, it, there's a reason you want those seeds um another question for you based on the way things are right now just like how wild could it get because i mean the aces are a game away from or a game off from or is it a game and a half no it's one game back of the sun Mm-hmm. And you know the the storm and the links and the mercury are all like bunched up, but I wouldn't necessarily say that like I tr- well I do trust one of those teams more than the rest. But based on <laughs> the way the mercury have been going, like, how just wild could it get? So it it seems like the sun and the aces are solidly set in that top two and even though the aces are only one game back of the sun they have already lost the tiebreaker so they would have to finish a game ahead of the sun you know in order to get that one seed so i think you're feeling pretty good if you're connecticut um a dark horse here to kind of sneak into that two seed could be minnesota because they're only two losses behind the aces and they've got a just cupcake schedule coming ahead they have three straight games against indiana fever coming up where like i know it's hard to beat a team three times in a row but they're playing the Indiana Fever three times in a row. Like if you are looking for an opportunity to make up some ground in standings, that is a good way of doing it. So that is someone to keep an eye on for that two seed. Uh, I'm trying to remember what the tiebreaker is between the aces and the links, because that would obviously be important to look at. Um, oh, the links have the tiebreaker. Okay. So they're two losses back and have the tiebreaker. And like we just said, this, this not so murderers row of getting to play uh three games against indiana and then maybe a game against a washington mystics team that's no longer in it uh whereas the aces have like two games left against the sky another game against the mercury another game against the Lynx, and a game against the wings which you know it's not like a a gimme right the wings are fine i think the wings have settled into that seven seed comfortably i would say for you know playoffs so yeah that's that's one that i'm looking at is that two three because you're you're avoiding single elimination or you know you're stuck like in that winner take all scenario which again you'd favor whoever ended up as the three seed in that matchup but you just never know right um i think with seattle i don't have a lot of hope for them to come up into the two seed because they are three losses back and they have lost tiebreaker to Vegas. So it's going to be really hard for them to make up that ground. So that's when we start looking at that uh, four or five gap, because, you know, either you're playing one winner take all or two. And this is where it gets really interesting for Phoenix because they could, you know, eclipse one of Seattle or Minnesota to get to that spot and just like sit out the first round of the playoffs. And they have three easy games coming up, but then finish up with like Lynx, Sky and one other difficult team, which I'm forgetting right now. Uh, so those are like the pivot points that I'm looking at because uh, not only are there like meaningful stakes here, all of these teams are playing well. Um, and so that's what you want teams that are playing their best who are trying to, you know, get on top of one another, as opposed to just avoid falling behind to one another, which is what the race for the eighth seat pretty much seems like. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, who? Oh, how high could the, so you said like 
the sky are a team that like intrigued me because like mm -hmm. you know as we sort of talked about on and this is like a recurring thing now on the show is like talking about other podcasts this time we yeah. were on them, so like i guess that's okay <laughs> but like we talked on that podcast link below about like how hopefully james wade is keeping some stuff in his back pocket and waiting to just unlock that offense in a way that like mm -hmm. he hasn't shown throughout the season but like what is the ideal road for the sky? Like for if you were in charge of how things shake out schedule wise or, or mm -hmm. playoff format, like what would you want to see if you're the sky? Yeah. So I think it's pretty clear they're going to end up in sixth. Um, so you're going to get Dallas in the first round, uh, which I'm not really sure there's a way around that. And that's, that's whatever. So really it's which team would you most like to face at number three um, for the second round? And I think you want to avoid Vegas because uh, as great as Candace is, like that front court is very challenging to contain for Vegas. Um, so to me, uh, like they, they looked very good against the storm the last few times they played them. I don't, I'm not going to say that that's sustainable, but uh, if you can get like a more, see, I don't want to say you want to play more perimeter oriented team because like somebody's got to guard Brianna, like someone's got to guard, you know, uh, like you don't want to have, salute in a defensive struggle here like that's not best case scenario but i think a more open game probably suits the sky more uh so seattle would be interesting um i just think that the size of like minnesota with sylvia fowles and phoenix with Brittany, like those are things that chicago is not as well suited to deal with um so yeah i can't believe i'm saying this because again the storm employed Brand Stewart, but I think that's best case scenario for Chicago. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, it makes sense if you know you're worried about what exactly that offense is going to look like. You know, mm -hmm. in an ideal world, the sky get hot offensively, and like if Sloot and Quigley, like if they're hitting from the outside, and you have Candace just like orchestrating things, like it's it's going to be hard to stop. Mm -hmm. but how many stops are they going to be able to get? And like, that's, I think that's very similar to Phoenix, which is. Yeah. I think is, I was going to say like maybe Minnesota would be a good matchup just because they turn the ball over more. I mean, Chicago is very good in transition. And uh, I also just think that Minnesota is like not as good as the other teams. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, so Demiris is out for the season, the season right? Mm -hmm. So like, so it's a no-go with the playoffs, like, regardless. Sucks. Yeah. Ooh. She was quite good in last year's playoffs. It's uh, disappointing that she won't get a chance to reprise that because uh, um, I just, I love the way that she plays. You know, she's got a nice perimeter game, um, fits really well into that. Cheryl Reeve high-low concept that they've got going on in Minnesota. Uh, you know, I just, I like her game and she brought it when they needed it for her last year, so. Oh, well, injuries. Yeah, that's a shame. Um, yeah, unless you have other stuff like you really want to talk about in terms of playoff formatting, I guess we can pivot to our games of the week. Our games of the week yeah. featuring two teams that are firmly, well, Dallas is like, as you said, hmm. more or less in that seven. Um, but do you want to, so you pick these. Would you yeah. like to explain to the viewers why? Sure. Sure. Uh, so we've got four teams here who are in the seven to 10 in the standings, which means two of them are going to make the playoffs at the start of the week. It was sort of up in the air as to who was really in the leaderboard, you know, like everyone sort of got the same number of losses. Um, so we picked these back-to-back -back games between Dallas and Washington uh, who are currently in seven and eight or seven and nine. Um, and Dallas has kind of pulled away seven and eight. Sorry. Dallas is kind of pulled away. Um, Washington, I think, is still catchable by both the Liberty and the Sparks. Um, maybe more so the Liberty. But <laughs> uh, I just thought it was an interesting look at, uh, you know, someone's going to make the playoffs here, probably two teams, and I wanted to see what they looked like because Dallas is in this interesting phase where they missed Alicia Gray and Satu for a little while, so it's a good time to check in on, like, how everything else is going. Um, and then Washington's in, like, another one of their extended injury phases. I think the game that I had, Elena Deladon was in for half of it. Um, was she in your game at all? No. 
no <laughs> sorry about that and no tina charles right no so i mean yeah. my game um no tina no satu mm -hmm. no alicia no elena um <laughs> To be fair, I had forgotten that Alicia Gray was unavailable for these games. And so the starting lineup comes and I'm just like, Vicky. And then I looked at the box where I was like, oh, right. She was not available to her. <laughs> in, these, uh, in this podcast and the last one, we've, yeah. we've talked about Vicky quite a bit. <laughs> um, some people I know who listened to the last one found it um, entertaining. Oh, good. <laughs> when I used Vicky's name last, um, if you don't know what we're talking about, again, link below. Yeah. Anyway, so the, the Wings and Mystic split these two. Uh, so, you know, the, just like a, a quick peek at the schedules. Um, Dallas has uh, five games left. They've got Atlanta, Connecticut, New York, Vegas, and LA. So like a, you know, like a mixed schedule. Uh New York only has three games left against Dallas, Connecticut, and Washington. So I don't anticipate they're going to win against Connecticut, but you've, you've pretty much got to beat Dallas and Washington to get yourself into the postseason. Washington has seven, six games left. Um, Minnesota, Seattle, Atlanta, Chicago, New York, and Minnesota. So it, it's tough. <laughs> um, I was talking about this with someone on the Sparks the other day where like, uh, because the front half of the schedule was so conference loaded for the Commissioner's Cup games, now everyone's getting their inter-conference games in. And so that really sucks for all the Eastern teams who now have to play the good teams in the West. Uh, so that's about the only thing working in like the Sparks favor, let's say, <laughs> is that, you know, the other teams have harder schedules. Um, but it's not like it's that easy for the Sparks. They've got Connecticut, Seattle, and then Atlanta and Dallas. Um, so just, uh, I, I don't anticipate most of these teams winning more than two of their games the rest of the way. And so I think the standings as we see them now are probably the best bet for how they're going to finish, um, which is why it's a good thing we're focusing on the teams that are currently in seven and eight in Dallas and Washington. <laughs> so hopefully they have more healthy players the next time we watch them because Alicia Gray came back yesterday. So that was good. Yeah. Somebody Gold medal leash. Gold medal leash. Um, I did enjoy Kayla Thornton in this game. It's kind of a... Against my like best judgment, I had a delightful time watching Mariah Jefferson and Kayla Thornton, even though I wanted both of them to be on the court so much less. <laughs> yes. Kayla Thornton, uh, she's just really physical, really good at forcing turnovers. And Dallas in transition is just a beast to try to stop because you've got the threat of Arike just pulling up, which her release in transition my goodness, it is so smooth, so fast. Uh, same with like Marina Mabry. Um, they just, their collective speed is what impresses me most about this Wings team where like, if you watch them on defense, uh, I'm like, I'm not entirely sure that like schematically they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, but they can just make up their mistakes so quickly. Um, and the way they just dart through screens, like, that that speed is just very impressive. Um, I, I feel like I talk about the talent level on this Dallas team all the time. And like, this was just another thing that stood out to me was my goodness. Like they're just so fast in the half court and you have to be precise against them, which is why the mystics are such an interesting contrast because they move the ball better than just about any team in the league. Um, especially when they're at full strength. So that, you know, pinball passing versus Dallas's ability to just make up ground like rotating was really interesting to watch back and forth and you know I think with the Mystics losing Deladon at halftime that sort of just like it made them too fatigued in the second half to like compete with all of that energy that Dallas was throwing at them but I, I'm curious like did did you see something similar in the second game or was it more of just like Washington's offense figuring them out or okay um hmm <laughs> how best to I've been thinking about how to talk about this game because I mm -hmm. um I don't think the Mystics won this game. I think I think they survived it. Okay. Because um which they haven't this, been doing a lot of, so that's impressive. Yes. It it was it really was I don't necessarily want to say that the the wings lost this game because uh I don't they don't necessarily think that would be fair, 
but my eyes hurt from watching it. So it was it was really rough. If if I told you that Ariel Atkins, um, who I know I haven't checked the stats, but like is likely their second leading scorer and definitely their leading scorer without Tina Charles. Um, she went 0 for 6, 0 for 7 this game. Um, and she wasn't, she wasn't playmaking very much. It's not as if like she had a whole ton, she had a ton of assists. She accounted for zero points, which I can't remember as a, a Mystics fan. Like, uh, seems impossible. Mark, Mark has me saying it now. I'm not really a Mystics fan, but <laughs> I, I mean, I do like them. It's fine. It's whatever. Um, she contributed zero on the score sheet. And like, you know, Ar- Arike had a decent shooting game. Marina had a decent shooting game. Um, Izzy Harrison contributed. Like, there's no way I would have imagined the Mystics win that game. But they did, and it was it was incredibly sloppy, and I can talk about that later. But I won't go into as much detail as I imagine you will, because like I, I hope your game was better to watch. <laughs> um, um, yeah, that's fair. Uh, okay, so a couple of things that I really liked from this game. Uh, I think I, we talked about her at like the very start of us doing the show, but Izzy Harrison. I just like the way she moves in post. Um, she so the Dallas broadcast calls her Dizzy Izzy. Um, there, the defenders are kind of starting to pick up on the spin move. Um, there was one opportunity where Sydney Weiss totally read it and then like drew a charge. There was another one where somebody read the spin and just like completely blocked her, like just obliterated her at the rim because they knew it was coming. But I. I can still kind of understand why Vicky Johnson is so comfortable playing Isabel Harrison over, you know, more um, Bella Allery minutes or uh, Charlie Collier, who was a DNP CD in my game. I think she was in yours as well, uh, which God, a number one pick getting DNP CDs at this point in the season is, is a choice, is a choice. Uh, but yeah, I, I just like watching Isabel Harrison. She's got such a good uh, sense of where the ball is going to come on rebounds like her. I think Dallas gets like 10 offensive rebounds per game. And I have to imagine the bulk of them come from Isabel Harrison's positioning because she's just really good at knowing where things are going to land. And it's an important source of offense for them because I mean, we've mentioned this before the Dallas half half court offense is, it's a little rudimentary. So um, they get extra chances with Isabel Harrison and I'm I'm glad that's happening. Um, But then what was really fun about this game was this little Arike Natasha cloud, um, back and forth that was happening because not only are Arike and Natasha Cloud like two of the more talented players at their positions and I think especially because Arike is more talented offensively Natasha though she is good offensively I think she's a little bit underrated offensively honestly she's more known for her defensive prowess um that little back and forth was just delightful like um uh you know there's a there's a play in the first quarter where Natasha crosses over on Arike hits a jumper and then starts doing like a little count it you know, thing towards the bench. And then on the very next play, Natasha's chasing Arike around a screen and gets called for a foul. And Arike's just like clapping at the ref. Like, yes, yes, let's do more of this. Um, and so there's just like a lot of little attitude going back and forth between the two of them, which I mean, I'm, I'm all here for. Like they're two of the showier players in the league. And I'm, I'm happy to see them having a good time against one another because all due respect to Natasha Cloud, like this is a tough game to have to guard every day. Um, it's one of those where you just sort of look up the box score and it's like, oh crap, that's how many points Sukumba Wallet has. Like she just gets her stuff going all the time. Um, what I really liked of Arike's game in this one was that she was running a lot of pick and roll with a walk career who I have not seen play much. And I got to tell you, um, for like 25 minutes of game time here, I was ready to proclaim a walk career as the best player in 2021 draft class. <laughs> like, uh, sorry, Michaela onion <laughs> Like, I think based on these 25 minutes alone, a walk should have been rookie of the month. Uh, it was outstanding. Um, I didn't even know that she had these like moves in her bag. Like she's, uh, really smart rolling, uh, off of these recapping and rolls. Uh, she was defending on switches. Like she got caught um, on a switch on Natasha Cloud and Natasha just like had no idea what to do around her, which 
I mean, like two possessions later, Natasha gets Bella Allery on a switch and just obliterates her, like blows right by, but she couldn't do that with a walk. And Bella Allery is like supposed to be like the defensive presence, you know, that Dallas wanted at center. Um, but I was, I just, I couldn't take my eyes off of her in the half court. Like she was popping out for threes. I mean, I admittedly, I had not watched her play an ounce of basketball before she got drafted to the WNBA. And, uh, it's taken her some time to like get into the rotation here because again, Lord knows what's going on in Dallas, but I am here for the walk experience. Uh, she is hella fun. She's just got super like great length, which makes her very useful in like any kind of defensive scheme. I mean, like I tell you when I saw her spot up for three, I just like, I had to pause, rewind and watch it three more times because I could not believe that it was actually her doing that. Uh, but yeah, Hey, I I'm here for a walk. Um, I don't know what, you know, the future of the Dallas front court looks like, but she's a girl I want playing a lot more minutes. Yeah, I mean, a walk is um, her decision making. It's it's interesting to me, not not necessarily interesting in a bad way. It's just like no, no, no. There, yeah, yeah. There are things there that, ooh, um, there's some there's some pop there, quite a bit of pop, and I sort of saw that in she she was scoreless. In my game, um, she did get to the free throw line um, and hit both. Um, but well, I'm glad I got used... my game then. <laughs> for, a, for a number of reasons, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, but no, Awak was like the trigger person in these DHO and horns actions. Uh, and like it, it works. There's flow to it. Like the thing about Dallas and uh, that I've talked about like plenty of times before is that it seems clunky regardless of they run out of one base alignment and like you can have like a billion plays out of that sure but like none of them look smooth really um, but with a walk it's it kind of it makes sense again didn't contribute very much in my game offensively but um, or on the from a scoring standpoint but like mm-hmm. it yeah I mean if Charlie's not going to play then like give all the minutes to walk yeah <laughs> yeah and I mean the offense sort of like she wasn't scoring much later in the game but she uh deflected a pass from Teresa plays on slate and then uh, uh doesn't exactly get her hand on the rebound on the final possession but like Dallas is up uh two and you know there's an offensive rebound op- opportunity and she just like gets in plays on way enough you know so that Teresa like hits it out of bounds and now it's Dallas's possession again, which is, you know, very important when there's 16 seconds left in the game. So it just uh, has decent feel, you know, for what she's doing on the court. Um, and like, I didn't always get that watching Charlie Collier at the start of the season. Um, so, Hey, you know, something here, but I, I just, I had so much fun watching her and I, I'm disappointed that there's only what five games left of Dallas for me to see her. Oh, I'm sorry. Also, uh, one single woman should play off game because, as we established, it's going to be making. <laughs> I mean, um, so that was largely the front court that you saw. Um, a walk in Izzy. Yeah, um, Bella Allery actually started, um, and did not leave much of an impression. Um, oh. But I think. I mean, I, I just never notice her on offense. Like I see her on defense. I see what they're doing on defense with her, but I don't, I don't see her rolling on offense. I don't see her really rebounding the ball. Um, I, she just needs to become more of a presence there uh, for me in order to earn those minutes. It's probably because she's so far away. Cause she's like on the elbow and horns and then just <laughs> goes further and further out. Um, yeah, no, um, Bella was, Two, actually, yeah, I mean, they're all highlights, really. But, like, one sort of highlight play that was very weird because I went to the video box score and it's recorded as a steal, but it's most definitely a block. Um, Oh, yeah, I hate when that happens. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah, there was that. Uh, There was another possession where she – it was her only field goal and field goal attempt of the game, but, like, she ran the floor for a layup. So, Hmm. like, you know, there there were highlights there. She did start. There were moments where she showed flashes defensively, but like to your point, like there is very little there to she's a solid screen setter. Like mm-hmm. that's I mean, you know, if that's you useful. 
<laughs> play defense hard and you set good screens, then like that's all you can really ask of a big. And it makes me wonder like what Charlie isn't doing. Um, right. But like you said, to not play Charlie is a choice at this point in the season. So <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was, I was kind of disappointed with Washington's offense in this game after Elena came out. Um, it was very much, we're just going to space the floor uh, and let, you know, someone just try to go to work in the middle of the paint, uh, whether that was Maisha Hans Allen, who just has like a lot of tools in her bag. Like if you give her an open lane and just let her like take a hook shot, it's sometimes it looks really good. Sometimes it's not so good. Um, and, you know, like it, it was, it was hit or miss, you know, <laughs> like, there was some nice moments, but I, I just didn't feel the same, like beautiful mystics ball that I was hoping for. Uh, you know, especially because like, I'm going to sound so bitter, but like I watched the mystics just eviscerate the sparks, right. You know, in this game last week, and I'm thinking, oh, this is what they look like again with Elena Deladon. And then it just wasn't quite that for this game. And again, part of it is Dallas has a little bit more speed and like, it's, I think they're a, a better sort of defense for this mystics team. But I also just thought that they were going a little too ISO heavy for my taste in this game. And um, a little, the balance between Maisha Heinz Allen and Ariel Atkins was a little too tilted towards Maisha, but apparently in your game, it was probably the right balance if Ariel wasn't getting the job done. Yeah, I mean, so it reminded me very much of the twofer we did for Storm Wings in the second game. It just felt like shots were, legs were a little bit more tired, shots were a little bit short, a little bit long. Every single shot that Ariel took, with the exception of maybe one, was it looked like it was going in and it just clanged off either front rim or back rim. And mm -hmm. that's not necessarily always the case with Ariel. The The shot selection is, I believe you said it last week, it's a, it's ambitious at times. Mm. Um, but no, she was, she was very much within herself and within the offense in this game. It just, you know, it just, it just wasn't working. But like defensively, she was still making stuff happen. And I, I mean, I, that's the value of Ariel Atkins. And again, like the Olympic team, that competitive atmosphere, like she's just the type of person who doesn't take any plays off. So Maisha and Ariel, actually, Maisha was probably offensively speaking, their second most productive player. I wouldn't say she was their um, second best player. Natasha Cloud was far and away um, the best player in this game, but I can talk about mm -hmm. her in a little bit. Yeah, I, I sometimes I'm surprised when I look at these Errol Atkins stat lines and just the, the number of shots she misses. I I wasn't expecting when I get to the box score, um, but I just like the way she plays with so much. I think I don't know if we said this earlier, but like the oomph, right? Like everything is really high speed. Like how fast she comes off of THOs or how much elevation she gets on her jumpers and just like the blistering pace and transition. Like everything is just turned up to like 120% like compared to everybody else on the team. Uh, so she really just stands out. Um, but uh, it's, I'm not sure that she's like number one option, you know, when Tina Charles and Elena Deladon are unavailable, like it just, her game is not at that level yet from an efficiency standpoint. So, uh, I mean, we saw this earlier in the season with like Skylar and with Jewel Lloyd, like it just, it takes some getting used to of having to scale your game up to that level and, fascinating that they're all guards on the Olympic team who are learning how to do this. Um, but yeah, there's, there's clearly something there with all of them. Um, we're just starting to figure it out. But yeah. Uh, I just don't want to talk about the, the end of this game real quick because um, so there's uh, a minute left, you know, Dallas is, has the ball and I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to make sure I diagram this play for Evan later. And then I was like, why do I need to diagram Dallas play? It's going to be horns. And lo and behold, they set up in horns. Um, Arike does an Iverson cut, right? <laughs> um, she loops back through the screen, uh, loops back in between the two, you know, um, what do I call those players at the top of the heel? Like the, the elbows, the horns, the elbows, like what do I yeah, call the players? I don't call them the elbows. Do I, uh, I call uh, the posts. Cause I mean, that's okay, the high yeah, post yeah. Technically, anyway, but like, sorry, let's call um, them the horns. We'll call them the horns. Yeah. So, uh, Arike Iverson cuts and then she loops back through the horns. Right. Uh, Natasha cloud reads this the entire way. Like she goes under the screen. She knows Arike is going to come back through there meets her right there. It doesn't matter. Arike just blows by her anyway, gets an and one. Um, and that's the game. Like I, I love Natasha Cloud's defense. 
it's really hard to contain Enrique Gonzalez for step. It's so hard, especially when, like, I don't even think this action, this Iverson loop thing created any advantage for her, like none whatsoever. Um, and she still just blows right by Natasha. They originally call it like a charge on um, Enrique, like even though Erica McCall clearly has like two feet inside the restricted circle. Uh, it They get the call right. She gets the basket, gets the N1, and that's basically game for the wings. But that's, I mean, we, we talk about this sometimes with Vegas, where like, even if you're not optimizing your players, sometimes just the level of talent makes them look really good at all times. And this is the same thing with Enrique. Like, I, I don't know that like this setup did anything to make her job easier, but she's Enrique Gumbawale and she's a fantastic scorer, no matter who you put on her and you put the ball in her hands at the end of the game. She missed a free throw at the end, which uh, gave me weird old flashbacks, but, um, <laughs> uh, scoring at the end of the game that girl can get the ball in the cup and I'm very excited to see her in a winner take all setup in the playoffs no matter who they end up playing yeah I mean that was that was the thing I was most excited um for when you said that like you think that Dallas has more or less like locked in that spot mm-hmm. is I mean we talk about this with um Brianna Stewart like you know winner take all game like are you going to bet against her? No. And no. I mean, that's, that's the same thing with Enrique, right? Um, and she has, she has earned the, the, the reputation and she, she has that sort of mystique of like, mm-hmm. like I talked about in, in that storm, like back to back where she hit that insane game winner. It's just like, I don't know, like going to the final, like minute and a half, like she had nothing going. She, she right. seemed like the wings seemed dead in the water. And then, like, she rattles off, like, 10 straight points, like, somehow, some way, and I cannot explain to you how. But, like, she just does it. And, um, yeah, I, I mean, I've said this a whole bunch, but, like, it blows my mind just how she can, she can talent um, the, oh, I don't want to be mean again, the, eh, the predictable. It's a, uh-huh. it's at this point become a predictable offense. And like mm-hmm. the way that like Marina, Arike, and uh, I mean, Izzy um, in, in your game and I, I, in my game, um, like we're able to just pull this team through. Like, it's just going to be so much fun. In, like, She's way. just one of the best clutch bucket getters in the league. Like I can't think of, three more people I'd rather have the ball in their hands at the end of the game than Enrique. Um, like I, she just can get her shot no matter what, because she can make shots from anywhere. Uh, so it's, it's a really impressive skill. I mean, and uh, of keeping the technical account watch on Enrique, right. I think she has six, the next one will get her suspended and Dallas probably can't afford that, but uh, that's, that's just the kind of fire that she plays with all the time. And it's going to be really cool to see her in uh, a setting befitting of her talent. You know, like she was so great in the all-star game um, when she was playing against like the elite of the elite in the league and like, whoever they face in the first round is going to be no joke. Like whether that's Phoenix or Chicago or whoever it happens to be like, that's, it's going to be a tough contest and she belongs in those kinds of things. It's been too long that she hasn't been in them. Right. And I mean, I can just like, when you said like three other players, um, I just I just thought of like the showdown, as I've already said, like in a winner take all game, like imagine her going up against her Marina going up against like Skylar and, and Diana, like in just like guns blazing, like every shot is gonna get shot type of shootout. Like that's yeah. gonna be look at me avoiding talking about my game of the week. Um I mean, we didn't do a spark joy segment yet, but I just wanted to uh, point out that watching Marina Mabry and Sydney Weiss guard each other and score on each other was the hardest thing I had to do all week. <laughs> uh, I'm very happy uh, for them. <laughs> um, oh, I mean, I guess I can ask you about your game because like, as we talked about off the pot, Sydney Weiss <laughs> was a non-factor offensively in my game. Um, how was Sydney Weiss this game? Yeah, so the jump shot wasn't working for her. Same with her and Marina, but they're such good backdoor cutters. Um, they're really good at reading the doubles and finding a way to get open. Um, I think Sydney had just like four wide open layups because 
of the extra attention that was being given to my Yusha or Errol Atkins or somebody else, like just finding her space right on the baseline. And then um, Marina was a little bit annoying to me in this game because she kept like stepping back and pulling up into long twos. And it's just like, one more step, Marina, like, <laughs> get the three, get the three. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was also more of the just finding a way to make something happen in the half court versus the jumper working. Cause it just, it wasn't really happening for either of them. Well, I have, I mean, good and bad news in that way. Um, the bad news is that Sydney, she, she did not, um, do any of that in, <laughs> our, not to say she didn't back cut. She did. She was very active yeah. offensively and defensively, but she, was also 046, I think, um, mm-hmm. in this game. A plus Marie- 13, though. <laughs> well, yeah, she did. She her presence. I still think was- good things happen with her on the court, you know, because yes. you have to guard her. Yeah. yeah. But Marina step backs. Step backs. Mm-hmm. The Marina was able to step back from three. And she hit these shots. And, like, that's the thing with Marina. I think I texted you this. And, like, understandably, okay. I got no response. Um, <laughs> I didn't know how to respond to it. <laughs> that's fair. Um, like, sometimes I would just think of, like, you know, I mean, I'm just I'm thinking about the games or watching the games. And I'm just, I'm, I come up with dumb nicknames. And it's just, like, Marina, if you're watching this, you aren't. But if you are, like, Mathrina Mabry, like, <laughs> It's not, it doesn't roll off the tongue, but it's oh, good it merch. Doesn't. It's good merch is what I'm thinking hey, about. She has great merch already. Okay. That's, yeah, that's true. That's yeah. really though. <laughs> yeah. You're right. Um, but like, uh, if we want to get into my I game. I forgot that I didn't respond to that text message. <laughs> you know, it's fair. I turned, uh, I, I told, um, I told my girlfriend about it and she was like, what did you want her to say? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And, and then she rightfully pointed out, she was like, don't you think it's better that you didn't respond? And I was like, actually, yeah, it's. <laughs> um, so. Oh, how to get into this game. Okay. Incredibly sloppy start to the game. The teams combined for 12 total turnovers and nine made field goals in the in the first quarter um together both teams Oof. the mystics and i i'm sure this is not a like an exclusive tradition but you know the mystics home fans don't sit down until they score their first basket yeah they were sta- yeah. they were standing until like six minutes and 45 seconds oh. into the game oh <laughs> So it was like first uh, game. <laughs> it got a little uh it got a little antsy. Um the, um if we're gonna talk about sloppy, like there's this one moment and like you know, this is this is sort of the joy for me of watching a full game is like you get these weird things that like you're never gonna get with the highlights. Um and it, I mean, it wasn't great, but it was funny to me because I needed some levity in the second quarter with like, and I'm not exaggerating, the world's worst jump ball. The ball was thrown up into the air and the referee like sort of like spun it to his left and like not spun it to his left that like the wings player who was jumping up was able to get it, spun it so that like it ended up at half court <laughs> on its first bounce. And um, and like the players had to laugh even the referee that threw it had to laugh which is like something we don't get to see very often is a referee owning the mistake that they made yeah. um so that should indicate how sloppy this game was but shout out to marina mabry who like came in and saved that first quarter this like audacious step back three and then she got a steal and hit it head to arike who hit like a pull up three above the break and then um, two possessions later, she Marina had this like insane. She switched. She got into the paint, and then she switched to her left hand and scooped it. Marina, in her two minute and four second appearance, scored or generated almost as many points as the Mystics that whole quarter. She <laughs> she accounted for eight in what I just mentioned. The Mystics had nine total. 
Oh, I mean, and then like the second quarter is like, I can just jump into like sets because like, Mm -hmm. if you've watched this, like, you know, I've broken down a lot of wings plays last week. I broke or the last episode, I broke down a whole bunch of mystic stuff. So there's not really a whole lot more to say. So I'll just get these out of the way. Horn set for Dallas, um, where the ball is entered to a walk at the right elbow, and then like a double stagger for Marina to come out of the corner. And then a walk mm. does a dribble handoff. And like Marina takes this handoff, and she's not really, she has no business stepping all the way back behind the three point line, especially after a handoff, but she does, and it's reckless. And she ends up, I mean, it's not as deep as some of the threes she has taken, but it's deep and it's well contested. And she shoots it over Plaisance and it's just, it's cash. But we'll recognize this set if you watch the last episode. It's Horn's rub where it's Maisha Heinz Allen this time. So Natasha sets that rub screen and then and then she eventually gets the handoff from Plaisance and then she's able to swing it. Poor deep miscommunication by the defense. So Plaisance gets a pump and an escape dribble pull up at the elbow. Um, Plaisance also had a very good game, er, relative to everybody else. Um, not a good game by most normal standards. It's so interesting hearing you talk about this game so far because nothing about it suggests that Washington is going to win. No, no, no. Um, and that's all about the third quarter. Um, and so I will say that like throughout this game, Washington seemed like they were they were game to compete it just didn't seem like the shots were going to fall and Mm -hmm. it just to dallas's credit they were hitting their shots early it's just that they turned the ball over so much that it became a question to me of like oh okay is washington just gonna hit is dallas just gonna not hit is it gonna be the turnovers it was all of them it was all of those things (laughs) um but like the last thing I want to do is like uh, from a set breakdown is horn set for Dallas. Surprise, surprise. The bigs go down to the blocks, screen for each other and come back up. And then it, if you're familiar with chin action, Marina swings it and then cuts off the back screen. And then the danger here is that, and this is where Bella being a good screen setter plays out, is Marina cuts right off of her on the right lane line. And then Bella half turns, so she's facing the sideline. And then she sets a wide pin down for Arike to come off. Obviously, that's hyper dangerous because are you staying with Marina? Are you staying with Arike? You don't have to worry about Bella, but she's a good screen setter. She she finds a way to contribute. And ultimately, Marina gets the ball inside and won. You know, just wanted to highlight that, like, that stuff still works, I guess, as long as you're running horns, if you're dead set on it. Um, Yeah, but... Arike saw a bunch of different coverages today, which is like as interesting as it's uh, going to get for me. So they were weaking her, which is to say we're sending her to her like weaker hand. And, you know, her crossover is so lethal that you want to keep it in her left hand as much as possible to the point where they weren't necessarily denying her screens. They were just pushing her to her left, regardless of where the screen was at. So that ultimately like worked out because like they won the game. But like they sent to her way a lot of the time, even to the point of it seemed like a needlessly aggressive hedge where the big on a pick and roll would just like stay on her and chased her all the way to the opposite sideline before retreating back to her original mark. And then like applying light pressure on her full court, you know, not not necessarily 94 feet, but just making her work a little bit extra. Because eventually you hope that it will wear Arike down. And I don't necessarily want to say that like that's why the wings lost, but like couldn't have hurt. Um, which brings me to the third quarter. And it's really you talked about Natasha Cloud being one of the more like demonstrative players in the league. Like that really bore out in the third. Natasha Cloud had and credit to like Christy Winter Scott, who was on call for this game. She talked about how it was it was shades of championship run Tasha Cloud, where she was such an offensive threat and she was like pushing the pace and stuff. So she brought the Mystics and the arena alive. She scored 15 points and had an assist in that third. So her 17 points, the Wings only scored 18 in the third quarter and Tasha scored 15 and had that one assist, which she largely made herself and had a drop-off pass to Megan. Yeah, it was the Natasha Cloud show. Tasha also kind of had the dagger 
It was like a minute left to play, 10 seconds left on the shot clock. Maisha Heinz Allen goes up to set a screen. They switched that action. So Izzy got switched on to Tasha. And Tasha just ISOed from the top of the key, got into the lane, and then jumped off of her right foot and faded backwards, which is not the easiest thing to do, you know, because she's a right-handed shooter. But as she's fading backwards, she shot over a walk and she banked it in from the left side. That was the dagger. It was the Natasha Cloud game. I I marvel at like the things that she does sometimes because like there's just so much fire and flash. And like to do this without Tina Charles and Elena and Ariel Atkins not really contributing and like Sydney Weiss, like surprisingly having an offer on this game, like... Mm. That's that's tough. Um, so it wasn't really like the pinballing of the ball around for the Mystics, although like that did sort of happen more as they got more into the game. But it was the defensive pressure they were exerting. Like nobody averaged like double digit shots except for Maisha Hines Allen. Plaisance had nine field goal attempts, only hit four, and those were largely created by. Tasha Cloud like doing her thing. I don't know what this team is gonna look like come playoff time, but if they're healthy, um, yeah, these these sorts of experiences can only help them because like they're figuring out ways to win without Tina Charles. So like that'll be good, I think. Tasha's just a gamer, like, um, and it, I think it's so fitting that like you know my end game my game ended with Arike like getting an and one to put them up to. And then your game sort of ends with Tosh getting the dagger. Um, and a game that Arike was quite good, but like, I think that's sort of the matchup that defined both of these games is the two of those guards. Um, how, how do you think that the Mystics were able to keep Arike from being like effective as a passer in that game? Was it just like the hedges coming up so high that she had to get the ball out early or? Yeah, I think... I think one of the most dangerous things about Arike is her ability to, she can, she makes her mind up in the air sort of, is like if she's jumping up, she can, she almost always looks like she's pulling up, right? And Mm -hmm. then at the last second, if she decides to pass it up, like she can't because she has the ability to make those decisions in the air. But like that is reliant on the fact that like she gets into her shooting pocket, she gets it into her right hand. And I think the strategy of like either sending two, so at least her shooting pocket is covered or weaking her, forcing her left. So you're pushing her further and further away and she's not able to get these like wild hook passes that you know she can Mm -hmm. throw. I think it was that, but it's also, Tasha was very game for the matchup. And like, I didn't watch your game, but I imagine if you lose to Arike and she had, you know, and she has the dagger. Essentially the game winning basket, yeah. Yeah, if Mm -hmm. she will let you know about it. Yeah. (laughs) And Tasha is the type of person um who i mean i'm sure she doesn't take it personally off the court but like in between like on the hardwood like in between the lines like she she remembers that stuff um so yeah yeah i I don't think they were trying as hard to force three get her weekend in the first game it probably was an adjustment they made between the first and the second because uh she was getting to the rim pretty easily in that first game and even if the scoring output was about the same. I think she had like nine assists in that first one. Just a lot of easy dump offs in the paint where I don't think those were available to her later on because of all the attention that was being provided to her. But I mean, when you're, when your turnovers are outdoing your assists, like even if Rike is scoring, I think that's just the balance you have to strike because she's going to impact the game somehow. So as long as you limit it to her just being a scorer instead of her being a facilitator as well, um, then I think you've done your job. Right. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's, it's this weird thing of like, there was a sort of mirroring on, on both ends, which is like, so Izzy Harrison, like um, eight for 12, Arike seven for 12, Marina six for 14. And then like everybody else either only attempted one field goal or like uh, only made one. Um, mm-hmm. And then on the other end, like Tasha was six for 12. Uh, Plaisance was like four for nine. And then Maisha Heinz Allen was six for 14. And then everybody else was like, you know, the, the Mystics got more shots off, the 62 shot attempts to, like, the wings, like, 47. Um, oh, damn. Oh, yeah, and so, like, um, Christy Winterscott pointed this out. Again, like, Megan McPeak and, like, Christy Winterscott do a great job um, on, on the Mystics call, but they pointed out that, like, in the second half especially, but, like, in the second half of the second game, the mm-hmm. um, Mystics made a more concerted effort to pound the offensive glass, so it's not necessarily that they got more shot 
well, they did get more shot attempts, but they didn't get that many offensive boards, but they just kept Dallas's transition at bay. Um, and as you pointed out before, like when Enrique gets out in transition, like it's just, it's lights Good out. Good game. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, I think that was it. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's two interesting teams. Uh, I still like, we, we had the, just like that brief flurry of Elena coming back right away and then playing so well against Seattle and then just blowing the doors off of the Sparks and you're thinking like, okay, this is going to round back into form for the mystics. And we just, we're now back to the point like square one where we're just waiting for everyone to come back and the clock's ticking. And I'm not sure if it's going to happen in time for us to see like a fully realized version of the mystics before the playoffs. And I mean, it was never going to be fully realized without, you know, Miesemann and Clark, but like even just like Elena and Tina together, could we get that for one game? Maybe, I don't know. Um, but that would, that'd be interesting. <laughs> Who would, I mean, so while we're here, as we sort of transition away from our games of the week is if you're the Mystics and like Elena can't come back, but let's say Tina is able to go, who would the ideal matchup be? Is it different who you want to see with Elena versus without Elena? That's an interesting question. Um, hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Uh, I, I guess it kind of depends on like how the other team tries to match up with you. Like Vicky Johnson said something really interesting about how they didn't want to play Charlie Collier against the mystics because they were starting two fours and so they deliberately went a little bit smaller um i'm like i don't think a team that's better than dallas would make that same calculation like you're not gonna i always think it's a mistake when you try to play into the hands of the underdog you know like there's a reason why you have exceeded them in the standings to this point and i think it's probably a formula you should try to stick with uh hmm. i i guess i just Let's say Tina is able to go and she's as healthy as she can be. Okay. Um, is the matchup different if you have Elena and Tina or just Tina? Or if you just have Tina. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, I, I don't I don't really think so. I think they're still gonna try to play the same way. Um they're just better at it <laughs> with Elena. Uh but yeah, I, I think the style of play only really changes if like both of them are unavailable, in which case, like what matchup are we really even gaming for at that point? <laughs> yeah. And is there a scenario where like, what could the Liberty, like, let's say the Liberty win out because they, mm-hmm. they are a team who like, you know, can hold destiny in their hands as much as they can. Like, sure. what's an ideal matchup for them in the first round? Yeah. So the Liberty do not want to face size. Uh, I yeah. just not at all. Like they're just going to get beat up. Like, you know, like Sylvia Fowles, my goodness, what did she do to them? And Brittany Griner was having her way with them as well. Like, I don't really know what options there are that don't have a six foot five plus center for you to have to face. Like, gosh, I mean, they don't have the horses to play with Seattle. I don't think they just, they turn the ball over too much and let Seattle get out in transition. And you, you just cannot let Seattle get out in transition. And I think those are the only three options for the five seed. Right. So good luck, New York. I <laughs> really hope that Chicago pushes them their way off into the five seed. Like that's, that's my best case scenario for them. Um, and then I, I mean, we're here, so why not, why not throw <laughs> the last one in there? Um, what about the sparks? What about, what about... I, I think Minnesota is probably the best matchup for them out of those. Uh, they, they do a fairly good job of denying the ball into Sylvia to make her less of a factor. Like their perimeter defense is just so active. Um, and I think they kind of tapped into something interesting without Tolliver with Nia Coffey in the starting lineup. They just get so much longer um, at the one, two, and three with like, if you put Taya and Sykes and, you know, Coffey all together, it's, it's just hard to make entry passes against that defense. And Minnesota was finding that out. And I, I have to believe that the Sparks wouldn't be in another situation where they score four points in a fourth quarter. Um, I just have to believe it for my own personal well-being. Like I just, I refuse to live in a world where that is a, a replicatable situation. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I think a team that, you know, is a little bit slower, who does more of their damage in the paint um, is like, because the, the sparks are so aggressive on defense that they just hemorrhage threes a lot of the time. And that's fine against a team that doesn't have the quality of shooters. Like Washington does, you know, when they're bringing the ball around, but like, Minnesota is fine because they don't have that uh, offensive like burst. I think that some of these other teams can hit. Like, I think of Minnesota more as like a solidly good offensive team that really just beats you with their defense. And the Sparks' offense is already so bad that like, <laughs> which 
how much more are we really getting from a great defense here? Right. <laughs> Which is why I think Connecticut is a good matchup for them. I just think Minnesota is a, a lesser version of Connecticut. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So I, th- I mean, you said this, you said this yesterday that um, you thought that like in the bubble, you thought that um, the Lynx were like a light version of the storm. Um, but they didn't turn that way for some reason. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, if, if the Lynx sparks a game does, does happen winner take all we get to see amanda zowie be fee the rematch that'd be cool uh, Zowie like barely got to play yesterday in that game um there was a lot more lauren cox than i was expecting um, so would you say that lauren cox sparks joy you know i'm i'm growing to be a fan of lauren cox i gotta tell you uh she's I, I can't figure out why Indiana would cut her, honestly. There's just a lot that she knows how to do on the court. She and NECA are really starting to figure out how to play with one another, just finding each other's spots in the post. It helps that NECA can space out a little bit. Lauren Cox did her first three of her Sparks career yesterday, which was very exciting. She followed that up by blocking Fee on the other end and then had another block and Sylvia Fowles later. And like, not just like a regular, like standing up, you know, like she like swatted at Fee, which was awesome. But yeah, I, I can see something there. And, you know, I don't think Chinea Gumake is like, a long-term prospect just because of her health concerns, you know, like it's fair to wonder how many years she has left in her. So you've got to start rebuilding that front court and Hey, you know, a former number three draft pick, like however you think that lottery should have gone. I think everyone pretty much agreed that Lauren Cox was going to be like a stud prospect in the WNBA and she's really hasn't had a chance to show yet. Um, There's something there. There's something there. Cool. Very cool. Um, that reminds me, we were talking about um, Dallas once upon a time ago, and it's like, we talked about, I think, Charlie would be the type of person who like would do great in like a different system, maybe. So yeah, that just reminded me of that. Yeah, I mean, so much of it is just about like opportunity. Like, I, it's strange that like, you, you want your players to be as versatile as possible, right, to like fit into a variety of scenarios. But at the same time, with like, the turnover and like the, the lack of roster spots in the W you almost need to have like just a standout specialized skill so that you have to be kept around for that specific skill. Like, I feel like Nia coffee has sort of found herself in this, like somewhere in the middle of those two aims because she can do a lot of little things very well, but like, I don't think up until this season, you could point to one thing and be like, Hey, that's what Nia coffee brings. Um, and now it's like, Oh, she's like a great help side defender damn, like that's an awesome Nia Coffee skill. And like, I don't think before this season, I would have looked at her game and thought, hey, this is one thing that she can do better than the average WMA player. Maybe she was like average at a lot of things, but I almost wonder if like you kind of need to be at that point where you need something excellent as opposed to just being somewhat good at everything else. I don't know, it's, right. it's a theory I'm bouncing around. But yeah, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to use those words. <laughs> well, that hurt. Um... Um, I wasn't trying to like, you know, go to you or anything. I apologize. No, no, no. I, <laughs> no, I, I, that's exactly what I was going to say. It's, um, it's like, I mean, this is, this is the thing with coaching. It's just like, especially since, you know, I coach high school basketball and like, we do have tryouts and stuff. Like if you're watching this and you're in high school, like, here's the thing. We want you to be good at like a lot of stuff and that's cool. And like, those things stick, but like for you to pop, you have to be good at one thing and, mm-hmm. or at least you have to show the thing you're best at. And then like, as things, as time goes by, let's say you make the team, then you can work on all the little stuff, but like blending in is never, is never the way to stick out, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess we talk about what we're looking forward to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but I think there's a really interesting race at the top of, you know, the standings for that second seed and for the four seed. And there are so many good teams involved in them. So I'm just excited to see how that shakes out because they all can't play each other in the playoffs. So at least they'll play each other with, you know, real life stakes before then. Right. Um, and I am doing the opposite. I am, um, it's a fever dream down there. Yeah. <laughs> this is an easy one. It's fine. It's not. Um, um, yeah, it's the, the dreamer, not, um, they're not 
you said this, I think once upon a time, not about the dream, but uh, about a Sparks game is that uh, it's, it's not a good game, but it is a fun game. And like, I, you know, the dream, like I'll never get over like that. They play zone at the professional level, like more than other WNBA teams. Like I asked this very early on in the season, um, like do teams consistently play zone and no, the answer is no, not really. It's more like a stop gap between stuff, but like the dream legitimately like switch up, like matchup zone, like one, two, two, one, three, one. Like I, I like that type of stuff. And like, as for the fever, <laughs> if the fever signed Courtney Williams, I would watch them. Well, yeah. That that'd be very cool. Like if any team sends Courtney Williams, like I love Courtney Williams. Gosh, just instant fun. Anytime you turn on the game, love Courtney Williams. Yeah, yeah, that's as good a place to end it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, not not a lot of games left on that Courtney Williams Atlanta Dream contract. So, you know, at some point we'll preview free agency or something like that. But uh, that's a name to think about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's that one highlight. Oh my goodness, that that All Star Game highlight of Courtney with her old son teammates, and there's like, it ended with a John Quell touch pass to Bree Jones, and it was just, it was a beauty. And like, I keep seeing it because like League Pass will like rewind, um, or not rewind, but like they'll they'll show clips of Courtney mic'd up during the All Star Game, and that's one of the highlights there. Um, hmm. Yeah, that's a. I'll have that highlight here, and like that'll be a great place to end it. Yeah. Oh, so, I was yeah. just gonna add one last thing. I was gonna look oh. forward to. I'm sorry. Oh no, go ahead. Um, we again kind of alluded to this earlier, but uh, the official roster for the 21-22 season for ECAT came out this week, oh, yeah. and it is the most incredible collection of talents I have ever seen put together on one team. Uh, just, just to, you know, the WNBA players who happen to be on this team are Courtney Vandersloot, Allie Quigley, Brianna Stewart, Emma Mieseman, John Quill Jones, Brittany Griner, and Maria Vadiva. Um, I'm not super familiar with the Europeans they have on the team, but I know Alba Torrens is damn good. Uh, I, I am legitimately enthralled at the idea of Brianna Stewart and John Quill Jones playing next to one another. Like, I don't think I could think of two players I want to see play together more than those two. And because John Will Jones does not use American nationality, never going to happen, you know, on Team USA level, which is a real damn bummer. But uh, um, goodness, watching those players on the same team, oof, I like, I mean, we got to see Stewie Asia, Brittany Griner front courts in the USA basketball, but like, with all due respect to Asia, John Paul Jones is just a different specimen. And I, I'm so very excited for whenever that happens to see that team come together because whew, just, I mean, what, what are we doing here? Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be maximum spacing, right? Because like John Quill and Stewie can both can both space out and like John Quill, especially can like th- the, the grab and goes those two players can do. And like mm-hmm. the other one just takes off. Like, I don't, I don't know what you want to do there. And I believe like my immediate reaction to you was like, Emma Mieseman won like a finals. <laughs> she won a finals MVP. And she's like, what the fourth best front yeah. court player. We here? have the last, last three finals MVPs on this team. <laughs> oh my, I didn't even think about that. Oh Maybe four, depending on what happens this year. You know, I'd say there's a yeah. good chance of four, depending on what happens this year. Yeah. Oh yeah. So Russia. Congratulations, ECAT. Congratulations. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. So uh, think about that, and um, we'll catch you next time. Bye.